basis f of an e and applications. All right, so <clears throat> um, e to the x is, as I said earlier in class, the coolest function ever because the derivative of e to the x is itself. Oops, forgot to write the equal sign. Coolest function ever. And the antiderivative of e to the x dx is itself. Coolest function ever. Of course, we do need the constant of integration when we anti-differentiate. So <clears throat> this is, of course, the base of the natural exponential function uh, e. This natural base can be used to assign a meaning to a general base a. Um, because we can define a to the x as e to the ln of a to the x because of the uh, inverse properties of e and ln or inverses of each other. This is one of those properties and that x can be brought down in front of the ln still on the exponent to become that. And if you want to, and this is what the book does, they put the ln of a as a numerical piece because a is a number by the way, in front of the x. So it's a coefficient of x. That could be like e to the 2x or something like that, where ln of a is, is some real number. So for this, I do need to say that um, for it to be an exponential function, a must be a positive number, and it may not be 1. Because if it is 1, 1 repeatedly multiplied by itself never changes. And 1 to the x is actually just y equals 1 and that <clears throat> excuse me that horizontal line is not going to exhibit exponential behavior so it's not considered to be exponential um, so um, this is one way to have a base that's not e a to the x, like 2 to the x, 5 to the x, 12 to the x. Those are all um, different base uh, powers of, of a constant. And so we need to learn how to deal with those as well, how to find their derivatives and their antiderivatives and things. So before we get started on that, there are some things that you should remember from college algebra. Um, any constant that's not zero raised to the zero power is one. So, of course, zero to the zero is an uh, indeterminate form, and so that it has no particular value that we can specify. Second, when you have um, the same base and you're multiplying two powers with that same base, you keep the base and add the exponents. This should be no surprise. This is stuff you've known for a while. Number three, when you're dividing powers that have the same base, the answer will keep the base and subtract the exponents. <clears throat> and then the last one I want to mention is when you have a power that is then raised to a power you multiply the exponents. So those are a few properties that we're going to need to know. Now, one of the bases that's pretty common when you're in a physics or, or biology type classes, when you have an exponential growth or exponential decay type thing. For example, um, if you have a radioactive sample, it will have a half-life and that half-life uses a base of one-half for the exponential model of uh, that decay. And just as a reminder, in case you haven't heard this for a while, the half-life is the number of years required for half of the atoms in a sample of radioactive 
radioactive material to decay. So let's do an example involving half-life. <clears throat> the half-life of carbon-14 is about 5,715 years. A sample contains one gram of carbon-14, and that assumes at the beginning of, of the time period. That's how much you have, like right now. How much will be present in 10,000 years? Okay, so the half-life, just jotting uh, the information down, half-life is 5,715 years. And our um, amount at the beginning, Y is going to be the amount of uh, radioactive material we have. And the amount at the beginning, Y sub naught, is one way to write that. Or Y evaluated at time zero is another way to write that is said to be one gram. And the question is, um, what is the amount of material Y in 10,000 years? And of course, it's important to notice that the um, units of time are the same. Um, if, for example, that half-life had been stated in hours, and they ask us about years, we'd have to do a conversion. So since the time units are the same units, we don't have to do any kind of conversion there. So um, the um, model for this will be that the amount of material you have will be one half raised to the t divided by the half-life. This is a model for radioactive decay, where it's always going to, for half-life, it's going to be one-half raised to the t divided by the half-life uh, value that you were given. Um, so, for example, if we were to substitute in um, the half-life and let's say 5,715 years have passed, then how much is left? Well, if we use the model, it's going to be one half to the 5,015 over 5,015, which of course is one, and one half to the first is one half, which totally makes sense because you're supposed to have half as much after the half-life has expired or has passed. So that makes sense. So I think we're, we're okay with this model, at least I hope so. Um, so let's look at this specific value. What is y at 10,000 years? So using our model, that's going to be one half raised to the 10,000 over 5,715. Put that in your calculator. And you get 0 0.297 grams. Okay. So that is an example of half-life. Now, related to um, exponential functions with bases other than e, there are also logarithmic functions that have bases other than e. And we can define them in much the, much the same way as we did the exponential functions. So if we have log base a of x, and we're going to have the same restriction on a, a has to be a positive number. It cannot be 1. Um, and since logs and um, exponential functions are inverses of each other, that value of A is going to be consistent throughout. Now, <clears throat> to understand this next step, you need to know about something called the change of base property, which you hopefully encountered in a, an algebra setting at some point in your life. 
And what this does is it allows you to change um, any base logarithm to any other base logarithm you'd like. And that's particularly important um, if you had some kind of application where you had like log base 5 of 4 and you wanted to know, yeah, but how do I calculate that? Then you need to change your base. And generally speaking, you'll either want to go to base 10, which is the common logarithm, log base 10 of x, more commonly called just plain log of x, or you'll want to go to base e. And the reason those are the two favorites is that they're the most important and they're the two that are on your calculator. So those are the two that you would go to. And the change of base property says that you can change to any base you want. So I'm going to call this log base b of the original argument divided by log base, the same base b, of the base of the original logarithm. So in other words, you could change this to log of 4 over log of 5. You might want to type that in your calculator and see what you get. Or you could change it to ln of 4 divided by ln of 5. You can put that in your calculator and see that you get the same answer as you did for log of 4 divided by log of 5. And so because the natural logarithm in calculus is the one that we like to deal with because it's related to e, the base of which is the coolest function ever for an exponential function, we are going to change these always to ln. Even though log would work, um, in our world that's not what we want to do. So we would change that to ln of the original argument x divided by the ln of the original base of the logarithm a. So <clears throat> if ever we have a base logarithm that's not base e, we'll convert it to base e logarithm and go to ln immediately, and then we can treat it um, with what we already know. So uh, for example here, what, th what this will become in a little bit better form is that becomes 1 over ln of a. Remember, a is a number, so 1 over ln of a is going to be a constant. So 1 divided by that constant is just a number multiplied by ln of x. Okay, so um, the base e logarithms, ln of x um, logarithms, have certain properties and the base a logarithms have pretty much the same properties. So log base a of 1 like ln of 1 is 0. Um, log base a of a product is log base a of the one factor plus log base a of the other factor. Um, log base a of a power is the exponent of that power multiplied by log base a of the base of that power and log base a of a quotient is log base a of the numerator minus log base a of the denominator. Those are the exact same properties that we had before with ln, so there's no, no changes there. And of course um, that implies therefore that the exponential function a to the x and the logarithmic function log base a of x that they're inverses. 
and everything that's true about inverses applies to any valid base logarithm and its inverse um, that base to the x. Okay. <clears throat> um, so that leads us to the definition of logarithm for any base y equals a to the x if and only if x is equal to log base a of y. It's a definition of logarithm. Uh, second, I guess I'll write that as number one. Number two, um, since they're inverses of each other, a to the power of log base a, those have to match, of x will be x for any x that's positive, because you can't take the logarithm of 0, nor can you take the logarithm of a negative number. The domain of the log functions is always um, the argument has to be positive. And the composition of the two functions, log base a of a to the x, because they're inverses, like number 2, in the other direction, that has to be x. And that expo exponent there can be any number, any real number. So this is for all x. You just can't take the logarithm of a negative thing. And as I mentioned earlier, the base 10 logarithm is called the common logarithmic function. So a special version of this definition of logarithm is if you have y equals 10 to the x, the definition of the common logarithm is that if y equals 10 to the x, then x equals log base 10 of y, technically. But nobody writes that base 10. It's assumed to be 10. It's kind of like when you write square root. You generally don't write the 2 there. It's just so common that people just leave it off, and this is square root of 2. And of course, when it's 3, the cube root or the fourth root or whatever, we do have to have it. Um, the only one where we don't write the index is the 2 because it's so common. Likewise for the logarithm, especially because of the sciences, where they use base 10 all the time. Um, log base 10 is ubiquitous, and therefore um, common practice is not to write the base 10 when that happens. All right, so what kinds of problems would we perhaps encounter here? Um, let's work this example. It's called example A. 3 to the x equals 1, 1 over 81. Now, the technically correct way to do this would be Whenever you have an exponential and you're trying to get the x out of the exponent, if you take log base 3, in this case, of 3 to the x on both sides, because of the inverse nature of log base 3 and the exponential 3 to the x, um, you get back x. Okay. And then you might notice that 1 over 81 is the same thing as 3 to the negative fourth. And whenever you have log base something of that same something to a number, the answer simplifies to be that number because of the inverse nature of log base 3 and 3 to the something. It's the same thing we did on the left side with log base 3 of 3 to the x to get x. This is log base 3 of 3 to the negative 4 gives us negative 4. Okay, and that's that answer. Let's look at b. Log base 2 of x equals negative 4. So in this one, um, what we can do is, since it's log base 2, we can use its inverse and exponentiate both sides of the equation as a power of 2. And I picked 2 because it's the base of our logarithm. And because of the inverse nature of 
the um, exponential 2 to the something and the logarithmic log base 2 of something, this becomes x. And then we just need to simplify the other side. Uh, and that becomes 1 over 2 to the 4th, which is 16 in the denominator, so 1 16th. All right, just a little bit of college algebra review. Now, on to calculus. To differentiate exponential and logarithmic functions to other bases, we have three options. We can use the definitions of a to the x and log base a of x and differentiate using the rules for the natural exponential and logarithmic functions. In other words, we could convert everything into e stuff and deal with it using what we already know. Or, number two, we could do logarithmic differentiation. Or, we can use the differentiation rules for bases other than e given in the next theorem. So, it's your choice what you prefer to do. Um, before I get to that next theorem, I want to do one problem, um, or maybe two, um, where I show you the, the options. So, let's do y equals 5 to the x, and then over here we'll do y equals log base 3 of x. And we're finding derivatives here. Okay. Um, so, number one, we could rewrite this as e to the ln of 5 to the x, which is writable as, bring the x down in front, but I'm going to put it behind like that. And so the derivative of e to the something, coolest function ever, is itself times the derivative of the inside function. And for exponentials, the inside function is the exponent. And the derivative of a number times x is that number. And then we can realize that that first expression, where it came from, was that was the original. Um, well, let me underline it so you can see. This part right here is the same thing as right here, which is the same thing as this right here, which is the same thing as that. So by substitution, I can put 5 to the x back in times ln of 5. Okay, that's option number one. Okay, now let's do option number two. What we're trying to do is decide um, what's the best way, perhaps, for you, the one that you understand, the one that you think you can replicate, the one that you think you'll get right. Okay, so if I have y equals 5 to the x, and to use logarithmic differentiation, please recall that what we do is we take the ln of both sides and then bring that x down in front. That part looks a lot like something we did earlier. And now take the derivative of both sides of this equation with respect to x. So it's that implicit differentiation piece. And to do this, you might want to put the number in front of x. It's not absolutely critical to do so, but it follows the rules of differentiation we've talked about. So to do that's probably a good idea. The derivative of natural log of something is 1 over that something times the derivative of that something with respect to x. And the derivative of a number times x is that number. Then to solve for dy dx, which is what we're looking for, is what is the derivative? Multiply both sides of the equation by y. 
And then if we want the answer in terms of x, which if we can get it, that's what we should always do. And so that's natural log of 5. And if you look back at what the original y was, that's 5 to the x. So you notice that this answer and the answer in green up there that you can still barely see, those are really the same thing. Okay, number three. Number three. Um, the derivative rule that's germane here is that the derivative of any exponential with a base of a, a has to be a valid number, it's got to be a positive number, but that's not one, will always be the natural logarithm of the base times that power. And so if we want to do number three using this rule, if we're doing the derivative of 5 to the x, that's going to be the natural logarithm of the base 5 times 5 to the x. So if we have a to the x, that's almost as cool as e to the x because when you take the derivative, you get back what you started with. But the difference is you then have to multiply that by the natural logarithm of the base. And in fact, if we apply this rule to e to the x, which is a positive number that's not 1, that will give us the ln of e times e to the x. And of course, ln of e is 1. And that's the only natural logarithm of a number that's 1. And that's why e to the x is the coolest function ever, because it's the only one that gives you back exactly what you started with, because the ln of that number is 1. All right, so it is self-consistent, and uh, so that would work. All right, so choose which one you like. Okay, let's do this next one three ways. If y equals log base 3 of x, we can convert to e stuff, so that would be ln of x over ln of 3, aka 1 over natural log of 3 times ln of x, and taking the derivative of both sides, the derivative of a constant like 1 over ln of 3 times a function is that constant times the derivative of that function. And the derivative of 1 over x, I'm sorry, the derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x. And so that answer ends up being um, writable in this form. Sorry, I dropped my pen. Um, dy dx. Pin's not working now. There we go. Equals 1 over the number ln of 3 multiplied by the variable x. All right. Let's do this the second way where we use logarithmic differentiation. So with logarithmic differentiation, you uh, take the natural logarithm of both sides. Simplify the right side as much as you can. Um, so you might want to change that to be natural log of x over natural logarithm of 3. And then take the derivative on both sides with respect to x.
This looks really gross. Anyway, the derivative of natural log of something is 1 over that something times the derivative of that something. So this is going to be 1 over that something times the derivative of that something. And actually, um, that's our original y. And so we would have to know how to find the derivative of that, which is what we're trying to find to continue this problem, um, or just call it dy dx. Now that's not going to work. You know what? That just fails miserably because you have to know the answer to get the answer. So I'm going to stop on that one because that just kind of uh, is a dead end. So let's do number three. We have to skip down here below what I wrote earlier. Um, use the differentiation rules that are given. So um, the, the differentiation rule that we're going to use here is the, the, the derivative with respect to x of log base a of x is 1 over ln of a multiplied by x. So it's almost like ln of x. You do 1 over x, but you then have to remember to multiply by the ln of a in that denominator as well. So since we're dealing with uh, let me make sure I have the same problem. I'm not mixing things here. Uh, log base 3 of x, that's what it was. Um, the derivative the derivative of log base 3 of x should be almost like ln of x, 1 over x, but then that x is multiplied by the ln of the base of that logarithm, 3. And of course that agrees with the answer we got right there. So uh, you can always do that switch. The problem is that you're going to have to remember a lot of the algebraic things that you may have forgotten. But if you can remember them and use them properly, except for this number two that was kind of uh, self-defining um, on the natural log on the log base three side, um, you can do it that way. But I think you might see and hear in my voice that I really think memorizing these derivative rules is worth it. So if you turn to the next page, theorem five point one three, you have those derivative rules. Um, this is if you have just the variable x, but of course, if you have a variable expression that's not simply x, so a to the u, where u is a function of x, like maybe x squared plus 2 or something, then we're going to follow the same rule. We get back a to the u, because it's almost the coolest function ever, but then we have to remember to multiply that by ln of a. And then, because it's a, a chain rule situation, because we have a to the something, we have to remember to multiply that by du dx, by the chain rule. And then uh, this derivative rule for logs is similar. If we have log base a of not plain x, but some function of x, u, then it's almost ln of something. So we're going to get 1 over that something. But then that something's going to be multiplied in the denominator by ln of the base of that logarithm. And then the chain rule will kick in, and we'll have to multiply that answer by the derivative of the inside function, du dx. Okay, so um, that is actually going to be my preference, is to memorize those. That's the way I would approach that. So if I asked you to find the derivative for all of these, um, 
applying those properties, those derivative rules we just learned. This is going to be the derivative of almost e to the x coolest function ever. We get back what we started with, but then we have to multiply that by the ln of the base, so ln of 2. Part b, um, y equals 2 to the 3x. The derivative of that, and we're going to get back what we started with because it's almost like the coolest function ever, but we have to multiply that by the natural logarithm of the base. And then because 3x is not plain x, we have to multiply by the derivative of 3x, which is 3. So this final answer would probably best be written this way, 3 ln of 2 times 2 to the 3x. And another version of that you might see is if you pull that 3 up as the power of 2, that could turn into ln of 8, because 2 cubed is 8. Um, that's not a requirement in my book. Uh, don't think that that's the most important thing. But if you have a multiple choice test, um, it may be that this answer is the one, the last one is the one that's actually recorded as the right choice, and you won't see the 3 ln of 2 version of that. So that's just to make sure that you know a few algebraic things as well as your calculus stuff. Okay, C. Um, y equals log base 10 of the cosine of x. Okay, this is almost ln of x, or ln of something, but it's not. But we're going to treat it that way, sort of. The derivative of ln of something would be 1 over that something. But because it's not base e, we have to multiply by the ln of that base down here in the denominator. And then because that's not plain x, we have to think about the chain rule and multiply that by the derivative of cosine x, which is negative sine of x. And so that's I'm going to simplify to be, well, I'll take it in a couple of steps. Uh, negative sine of x over ln of 10 times cosine of x. So that's a negative 1 over ln of 10 times the tangent of x. Okay. And I think I'll continue with D um, in the next part. So I'm going to end this part right here. I'll talk to you later.